herbalist looked at King Dyke with piercing eyes and said, If you truly want to live, you must be strong. I will cook you in a pot for seven days. After that, you'll be indestructible. No human or spirit can harm you. The question is, are you ready? King Dyke's face turned pale with fear. This wasn't what he had expected at all. He had hoped for an easier solution, but this required immense courage. What in the world are you talking about, wise one? King Dyke exclaimed, his voice shaking. You want to put me in a pot and cook me for seven whole days? How am I supposed to survive that? No, I can't do it. There's no way. Obiora saw the terror in his friend's eyes and tried to calm him down. Dyke, listen to me, he said softly. I know you're scared, but this might be our only choice if you want to face your brother's ghost. You need to be brave for this fight. The herbalist's face twisted with anger. I have no use for cowards in my shrine, he spat. You should have been prepared before you came here. Obiora quickly intervened. Please forgive him, wise one. He's just afraid, but I'm sure he can do this. I don't have time for this nonsense, the herbalist growled. Someone who can kill shouldn't fear death. I'll ask you one last time. Are you ready for the ritual? King Dyke realized he had no other choice. He had to face his fears to defeat his dead brother. Taking a deep breath, he said, Yes, wise one, I'm ready. The herbalist nodded and suddenly produced a large, strange-looking pot. He set it over a roaring fire and filled it with water and a mysterious mixture. Get in, the herbalist commanded, once the mixture was fully combined. Trembling, King Dyke slowly climbed into the pot. At first, the water was cold and he felt no pain, but as time passed, the water began to heat up. It's getting hot, King Dyke shouted, panic rising in his voice. Help me, get me out of here. Instead of helping, the herbalist simply covered the pot with a lid. Turning to Obiora, the herbalist said, Go home now. Come back in seven days. Your friend will be out of the pot by then, stronger and more powerful than ever. Obiora hesitated, his heart heavy with worry. Will he really be okay? he asked. The herbalist nodded solemnly. If he survives, he'll be invincible. With a last glance at the pot where his friend was trapped, Obiora reluctantly left the shrine. As he walked home, he couldn't shake the sound of King Dyke's screams from his mind. He hoped that this terrible ordeal would be worth it in the end. The seven days passed slowly for Obiora, each moment filled with worry for his friend. As soon as the time was up, he rushed back to the herbalist's shrine, his heart pounding with anticipation and fear. When Obiora arrived, he was shocked to see the pot still boiling. His friend was nowhere in sight. Panic gripped him as he approached the herbalist. Great one, Obiora said, his voice trembling. Where is my friend? You said he would be out after seven days. It's now the eighth day and he's still in that boiling pot. Is he... is he dead? The herbalist remained silent, ignoring Obiora's questions. He walked to the pot, his face unreadable. He began to mutter strange words that Obiora couldn't understand. Suddenly, the herbalist lifted the lid. Obiora gasped. All the water had vanished, leaving only King Dyke sitting motionless in the pot, looking lifeless. What have you done? Obiora cried out as the herbalist dragged the king's body out and laid it on the floor. The king wasn't breathing. Obiora felt his world crumbling. You've killed him, he shouted at the herbalist. But the herbalist paid no attention to Obiora's outburst. He took out a strange object and began chanting again. He touched the object to the king's forehead. To Obiora's amazement, King Dyke's fingers began to twitch. Then his whole body started shaking. After a few tense minutes, the king's eyes flew open and he sat up as if waking from a deep sleep. Dyke, Obiora exclaimed, rushing to his friend's side, are you all right? King Dyke stood up, looking stronger and more confident than ever before. He flexed his muscles, a smile spreading across his face. The herbalist nodded approvingly. From this day forward, you are fortified with great power. No man born of a woman nor any spiritual being can destroy you. King Dyke turned to the herbalist, his eyes shining with gratitude. Thank you, great one. I knew you wouldn't fail me. I owe you more than I can say. Then a shadow of doubt crossed his face. But tell me, does this mean my dead brother can never haunt me again? The herbalist fixed King Dyke with an intense stare. 
Remember this, King Dyke. You are now stronger than anyone in this world. You can command even ghosts, and they must obey. If your brother's spirit comes for you, simply order it to leave, and it will have no choice but to obey your command. King Dyke's face lit up with joy and relief. He reached for his pouch, ready to pay the herbalist, but the old man held up his hand. No payment now, the herbalist said. Come back with your gift after your victory. As they left the shrine, Obiora couldn't help but ask, Are you sure about this, Dyke? It seems unnatural. King Dyke laughed, a sound full of newfound confidence. Don't worry, my friend. With this power, I can finally rule without fear. Nothing can stop me now. Obiora nodded, but a small part of him wondered if they had made a terrible mistake. King Dyke and Obiora left the herbalist's shrine, their minds still reeling from the incredible events they had witnessed. They walked in silence for a while, both lost in thought, before arriving at Obiora's house. As they entered, King Dyke turned to his friend. Obiora, he said, his voice filled with emotion, I want to thank you for everything. Your help means more to me than you can imagine. I knew coming to you would lead to a solution. Obiora smiled warmly at his friend. That's what friends are for, Dyke. There's no need to thank me. We've been friends since we were children, remember? You've helped me plenty of times, too. If anything, I should be thanking you. King Dyke nodded, remembering their shared past. Those were simpler times, weren't they? He mused. They certainly were, Obiora agreed. He looked out the window, noticing the setting sun. It's getting late. You should stay here tonight. It's late to travel back to your village in the dark. King Dyke hesitated for a moment, then nodded. You're right. I'll head back first thing in the morning. As they prepared for sleep, both men pondered the changes that lay ahead, wondering what challenges the future might bring. As the first light of dawn broke, King Dyke set out for his journey back to his village. His steps were confident, his fear gone, replaced by a sense of invincibility from his newfound power. Suddenly, the air around him grew cold. A ghostly figure materialized before him. His dead brother, Prince Abuka. The prince's eyes glowed with an otherworldly fire, his voice booming with rage. Why do you run from your sins, Dyke? Prince Abuka demanded. No killer escapes justice. King Dyke stumbled back, momentarily startled. But then he remembered his new powers and straightened up. Ha! Huh, is that what you think? I'm running from nothing. The throne is mine by right, and I took it as I saw fit. Prince Ebuka's form seemed to grow larger, his anger palpable. You murdered our parents. You framed me and had me buried alive. And you dare claim the throne is rightfully yours. You will face the consequences of your actions here and now. For a moment, fear flickered in King Dyke's eyes. Then he recalled the herbalist's words. Drawing himself up to his full height, he declared, I fear you no longer, Ibuka. You're dead, and the dead have no power over the living. Prince Ebuka laughed, a chilling sound that echoed through the air. Then today shall be your last day on earth? I'll spare you no longer, you'll reap what you've sown. The ghost's eyes blazed brighter, and he hurled a ball of spectral fire at King Dyke. To both their surprise, the fire dissipated harmlessly against the king's chest. King Dyke's shock quickly turned to glee. Ha ha ha! I'm fully prepared for you now, brother. I'll run no more. Enraged, Prince Ebuka launched another attack, but again it had no effect. Your powers may save you now, he snarled, but you will surely pay for your sins eventually. Feeling bold, King Dyke raised his hand and commanded, Be gone, ghost. Vanish and never return. To his amazement, Prince Ebuka's form began to fade. The ghost's eyes widened in disbelief as he disappeared completely. King Dyke stood alone on the path, marveling at what had just happened. Incredible, I can control ghosts now. Let him try to haunt me again. Now I can rule my kingdom forever without fear. As he continued his journey, King Dyke's mind raced with the possibilities his new power presented. Little did he know, his troubles were far from over. After his encounter with Prince Ebuka's ghost, King Dyke continued his long journey back to the village. As he approached, anxiety began to gnaw at him. What if they know, he thought, what if they've discovered I killed my family? Despite his fears, he entered the village. To his surprise, villagers bowed as he passed. 
They don't suspect me, he wondered, relief washing over him. As he reached the palace, everything seemed normal. The elders were there, waiting for him. Long live the king, long live the king, they shouted, their faces beaming with joy. King Dyke was taken aback by their warm welcome. One elder stepped forward. My king, what happened last time was very serious. Dyke sat on his throne, trying to appear calm. Yes, my elders, I understand, but I've taken care of it. My late brother was angry because he was punished, but he can't harm us anymore. The elders exchanged glances. Another spoke up. My king, terrible things happened while you were gone. Mr. Marcus was killed by the dead prince. Many others died too. An older elder added, some of us lost our children. Our crops were destroyed. We've been suffering and hungry. King Dyke's face showed concern. I'm deeply sorry for what you've all endured, but I promise the dead prince will never torment us again. Suddenly, two villagers burst into the palace, breathless with excitement. My king, one shouted. The rivers, they're back to normal. No more blood. They're flowing peacefully again. Before Dyke could respond, more villagers rushed in. The crops, they cried. They've stopped dying. Everything's growing again. King Dyke felt a wave of relief. He stood up, addressing the elders. You see? Everything is well now. I've dealt with the situation. My brother was punished for his crimes, and he can't harm us anymore. Elder Nwosu nodded. We're proud of you, my king. You've saved our land. Let's celebrate, another elder suggested. We must thank the gods for our king's bravery. As the palace erupted in cheers, King Dyke smiled to himself. His secret was safe and his power secure. But deep down, a small voice wondered how long this peace would last. The ghost of Prince Ebuka refused to give up. He continued to circle the village, seeking justice for his death. However, King Dyke's newfound powers prevented him from entering. Curse this barrier, Ebuka's ghost growled in frustration. How can I make Dyke pay if I can't even reach him? Suddenly, a thought struck him. Chukwudi, my younger brother, he's still alive and can enter the village freely. Ibuka's spectral form brightened with this realization. Yes, Chukwudi is the key. Through him, I can finally have my revenge and justice will be served. Meanwhile, in a neighboring village, Chukwudi was living with a friend. Despite hearing about the troubles in his homeland, he remained detached. Chukudi, his friend said one day, don't you think it's time to return home? Your people might need you. Chukudi shook his head. No, not yet. The gods seem to be handling things. Maybe they're avenging my family's deaths. His friend persisted. But as a prince, don't you have a duty to your people? Perhaps, Chukudi replied. But something tells me it's not the right time. I'll know when I should return. Little did Chukwudi know that his ghostly brother was already planning to use him as a pawn in his revenge against King Dyke. On a sunny afternoon, Prince Chukwudi and his friend ventured into the bush to gather firewood. Suddenly the air grew cold and the ghostly figure of Prince Ebuka materialized before them. Chukwudi's friend dropped his bundle of sticks, eyes wide with terror, but Chukwudi stood his ground, recognizing his deceased brother. Do not be afraid, little one, Ibuka's ghost said softly. It's time for you to return home. Chukwudi frowned, confusion etched on his face. Brother, why have the ancestors been silent about your death? I can't help but feel your killer still walks free. Ibuka nodded solemnly. You're right, Chukwudi. The killer lives, and it's our own brother, Dyke. He's proven to be evil, and I need your help to reclaim the throne from him. Chukwudi's brow furrowed. But wait, brother, you're a ghost now. Aren't you powerful enough to take your own revenge? The ghost's form flickered, a sign of his frustration. I wish it were that simple. Dyke has acquired great power. Even I cannot overcome him now. How is that possible? Chukwudi exclaimed. He's human, and you're a spirit. Ebuka's ghost sighed, a sound like wind through dry leaves. For now, he's more powerful than me. That's why you must go home and end this, Chukwudi. You're our last hope. Fear crept into Chukwudi's heart. But brother, I have no powers. How can I possibly stand against Dyke? Don't worry, Abuka reassured him. You won't need powers. I'll be the one to fight him. 
Dyke has created a barrier preventing my ghost from entering the village. But you, as a living person, can enter freely. You just need the courage to help me get inside. Chukwudi hesitated, torn between his fear and his desire for justice. Finally, he nodded. What must I do? Ibuka's ghost seemed to brighten. Dyke is getting married in four market days. There's a tradition where the bride must pass wine to you before her husband. This is our chance. Confusion clouded Chukwudi's face. I don't understand. How does this help us? The ghost produced three strange-looking seeds. These seeds are powerful, even more so than Dyke. When the wine is passed to you, slip one of these into the cup. Be careful. No one must see you do this. Chukwudi's eyes widened. But brother, the entire village will be watching. If I'm caught, you must be brave, Ibuka insisted. If you succeed, when Dyke drinks the wine, his powers will weaken. This will allow my spirit to enter the village and reveal the truth to everyone. Chukwudi nodded slowly, a spark of determination in his eyes. But then he frowned. If I only need one seed, why give me three? Ibuka's ghost smiled. They're all the same. I'm giving you extras in case you misplace one. Remember, your opportunity comes in four market days. Do not fail, little brother. With that, the ghost vanished, leaving Chukwudi alone with his thoughts. My prince, his friend's voice broke through his reverie. Are you all right? I saw you talking to yourself. Chukwudi turned, his face pale but resolute. I wasn't talking to myself. My brother's ghost appeared to me. He told me many things, and now... Now I must return home to face Dyke. His friend's eyes widened. I knew it. I always felt your brother Dyke couldn't be trusted. Everything happened too quickly. My prince, you must do as your ghostly brother says. Chukwudi nodded, his mind racing with the enormity of the task before him. Yes, I must, but the danger, the risk. His friend placed a comforting hand on his shoulder. You are brave, my prince, and you fight for justice. The ancestors will be on your side. As they gathered their firewood and headed back, Chukwudi's hand closed around the pouch containing the three seeds. In just four short days, he would face his greatest challenge. The fate of his family, his throne, and his entire village rested on his shoulders. I won't fail you, brother, he whispered to the wind. Justice will be served. The next morning, Prince Chukwudi prepared to leave. His heart was heavy with fear, but he knew he had to return home and confront his brother. As he was about to step out of the hut, he noticed his friend fully dressed and carrying a travel bag. Surprised, Chukudi asked, Why are you dressed like that? Are you going somewhere? His friend smiled determinedly. I can't let you go alone, my prince. This journey might be more dangerous than we think. I'm your friend and I'll stand by your side whatever trouble comes. Chukwudi felt a wave of gratitude wash over him. You'd risk your life for me? He asked, his voice filled with emotion. Without hesitation, his friend replied, We've been through much together. I won't abandon you now. The prince's face broke into a relieved smile. Thank you, my friend. Your support means more than you know. They clasped hands, both laughing with a mixture of nervousness and excitement. Well then, Chukwudi said, let's begin our journey back to Umaha village. As they set out, Chukwudi felt his courage grow. With his friend by his side and the memory of his brother's ghost urging him on, he was ready to face whatever challenges lay ahead on the road back home. After a long and tiring journey, Prince Chukwudi and his friend finally reached the palace of Umoha. As they entered, Chukwudi saw his brother, King Dyke, sitting on the throne surrounded by elders. Taking a deep breath, Chukwudi reminded himself of his mission and put on a friendly face. Long time no see, my dear brother, Chukwudi said, bowing respectfully. I heard about your upcoming marriage in four market days. I couldn't miss such an important event, so I've come home to participate. After all, it's not every day my eldest brother gets married. King Dyke's eyes widened in surprise. He hadn't expected to see his younger brother again. For a moment, suspicion flashed across his face, but he quickly masked it with a welcoming smile. What an unexpected surprise, King Dyke exclaimed, rising from his throne. Welcome home, brother. Please, take a seat. As Chukudi sat down, one of the elders leaned towards the king. 
My lord, is it wise to... King Dyke silenced him with a look. Turning back to Chukwudi, he asked, Tell me, brother, where have you been all this time? We were worried about you. Chukwudi carefully chose his words. I needed time to grieve, brother, but now I'm here to celebrate your joy. King Dyke nodded, his eyes studying Chukwudi intently. Well, your return has certainly added to the celebration. We have much to discuss. As the brothers continued their conversation, tension hung in the air. Both were playing their parts, each aware that much more was at stake than a simple family reunion. The day of King Dyke's royal marriage arrived quickly. The palace was filled with excitement as villagers and visitors from neighboring communities gathered to celebrate. Obiora, the king's childhood friend, was among the honored guests. As the ceremony began, young maidens performed traditional dances, their colorful skirts swirling to the beat of the drums. The air was filled with joy and laughter. Then came the crucial moment of the wine ritual. The bride, radiant in her wedding attire, approached Prince Chukwudi with a cup of wine. Chukwudi's heart raced as he reached for the seeds in his pocket. Stay calm, he thought to himself. This is your only chance. As he took the cup, he glanced around nervously. Everyone's eyes were on him. With trembling hands, he raised the cup to his lips, pretending to sip. Then, as he lowered it, he quickly moved to drop a seed into the wine. Suddenly, a voice rang out. Stop him. It was Obiora pointing at Chukwudi. The prince is trying to poison the king. Chaos erupted. Chukwudi froze, his hand still hovering over the cup. No, no, you're mistaken, he cried out. I would never harm my brother. Obiora's eyes narrowed. If you're innocent, open your hands. Chukwudi hesitated, his mind racing. But before he could decide, King Dyke ordered his guards to seize him. They pried open his hands, revealing two seeds. Gasps of shock echoed through the crowd. King Dyke's face darkened with anger. This is an abomination, he roared. My own brother, attempting to kill me on my wedding day. Mr. Okoro, one of the elders, stepped forward. Your Majesty, our traditions are clear. Those who attempt to kill must be killed themselves. King Dyke nodded grimly. You're right. Prince Chukwudi will be hanged two days from now, after our celebrations conclude. As the guards dragged Chukwudi away, he caught a glimpse of his brother's face. There was no mercy there, only a cold, wicked smile. In his prison cell, Chukwudi's mind whirled. Three seeds, he muttered. My brother's ghost gave me three seeds, but they only found two. Where's the third? As the sounds of celebration drifted into his cell, Chukwudi felt a deep regret. He had failed his mission and now faced the same fate as his brother Abuka. As darkness fell, he wondered if there was any hope left for justice in Umoha. The day after the wedding, King Dyke called a meeting with his advisors to decide Prince Chukwudi's fate. The atmosphere in the palace was tense as the elders gathered. One elder, his voice shaking, spoke up. My king, perhaps we should reconsider hanging the prince. After all, we only found seeds in his hand, and he is still your brother, a son of the palace. Another elder nodded in agreement. Yes, your highness, maybe we could punish him another way if he's truly guilty. Mr. Okoro, who had long sought to eliminate Prince Chukwudi to secure his own position, glared at the two elders. Silence, he shouted. Have you forgotten that he tried to poison our king? He must be hanged as an example to others. Obiora, the king's childhood friend, nodded. I agree. We can't show mercy to someone who attempted regicide. One of the older elders stood up, his face grave. My king, even if the prince is guilty, execution seems too harsh. If you insist on this path, I must remove myself from this decision. My conscience won't allow it. With that, he left the palace. King Dyke, his face twisted with anger, stood up. Enough, he roared. If anyone else disagrees with this sentence, leave now. I won't tolerate dissent in this matter. Several more elders quietly stood and left, leaving only Mr. Okoro, Obiora, and a few others with the king. King Dyke's eyes blazed with fury. My brother will pay for his treachery. No one challenges the great king and lives. He'll face the consequences of his actions. He turned to his guards. Bring the prisoner here. It's time he faces his judgment. 
The guards marched to the prison and roughly dragged Prince Chukwudi out. The prince stumbled, pleading, Please, don't do this. Spare my life. They pushed him before the king. Chukwudi fell to his knees. Brother, please forgive me, he begged, tears in his eyes. King Dyke's face hardened. Don't call me brother. You lost that right when you tried to kill me. Guards, take him to the forest and hang him. As they dragged Chukwudi away, the king and his supporters followed. In the forest, the guards tied Chukwudi's hands and feet, then prepared a noose on a sturdy tree branch. Chukwudi, realizing his fate, muttered, My brother's ghost deceived me. He knew this would happen. Suddenly, a fierce wind swept through the forest. Trees uprooted, houses crumbled, and people screamed in terror. King Dyke stood firm, confident in his magical protection. But the wind lifted Mr. Okoro off his feet, slamming him into a tree. The impact killed him instantly. Obiora, also magically protected, remained unharmed. But other elders were swept away, some losing their lives in the chaos. The guards holding Chukwudi panicked and fled, only to be crushed by falling trees. Villagers ran in all directions, some meeting their doom in the destruction. When the wind finally subsided, King Dyke and Obiora were the only ones left standing. They returned to the palace, shocked to find the king's new bride dead on the floor. This is no ordinary occurrence, King Dyke said, his voice shaking slightly. So many lives lost, I know it's my dead brother's doing. But I'm not afraid of ghosts. Let him come, I'm ready. As if in response to his challenge, the ghost of Prince Ibuka appeared, floating in the air. Beside him walked Prince Chukudi, somehow freed from his bonds. King Dyke stood his ground, ready for battle, determined to keep his throne at any cost. King Dyke's face contorted with anger as he shouted, I told you never to return, how dare you enter my kingdom? Ibuka's ghost replied calmly, This was never your kingdom. You're just a prince who betrayed his family for power. Your time ends here. I asked you a question, Dyke growled. How dare you enter my kingdom? Go back to your grave where you belong. Prince Chukwudi, growing impatient, whispered to Ibuka's ghost, Brother, why are you wasting time talking? Just strike him down. Ibuka's ghost turned to Dyke. You're right, the dead shouldn't mingle with the living, but I have unfinished business with you, evil one. Liar, Dyke shouted. Now leave, or face the consequences. Obiora, Dyke's friend, stood firmly beside the king, ready to fight. Chukwudi wondered aloud. What does he gain from supporting such evil? Dyke sneered at Chukwudi. When lions roar, ants should be silent. Who gave you permission to speak? Obiora stepped forward, his eyes gleaming dangerously. I admire your courage, boy, but stay out of this, or you'll see my true colors. Chukwudi shot back. This isn't your fight, stranger. This is our land, our kingdom. Enraged, Obiora stretched out his hand, sending a bolt of lightning towards Chukwudi. Ibuka's ghost quickly deflected it. How dare you attack a prince of this land? Ibuka's ghost thundered. He retaliated with a powerful force aimed at Obiora, but King Dyke blocked it. The battle intensified, with Ibuka's ghost unleashing powerful attacks against Dyke. However, the king remained unharmed. His powers combined with Obiora's making him seemingly indestructible. As the fight raged on, villagers fled in terror, seeking safety in neighboring settlements. Only a handful of brave souls remained to witness the clash. Realizing the ghost's persistence, Dyke taunted, Can't you see I'm indestructible? Your revenge is futile. I'll give you one last chance. Go back to the land of the dead and rest in peace. Chukwudi watched in disbelief, unable to comprehend how his brother's ghost could be overpowered. Let's end this madness, Dyke declared. He joined hands with Obiora, their combined powers creating a formidable force. Together they commanded, go back and never return, striking Ebuka's ghost with tremendous power. The ghost struggled against the combined force, but found himself overwhelmed. Despite his spectral nature, he couldn't withstand the onslaught. With a final anguished cry, Ibuka's ghost vanished into thin air, leaving Chukwudi alone to face the king. Terrified, Chukwudi turned to run. Dyke, showing no mercy, pursued him relentlessly. With a powerful strike, he sent Chukwudi crashing to the ground, gasping for breath. As Dyke and Obiora approached the fallen prince, even Obiora felt a twinge of pity. 
Perhaps we should spare his life, he suggested. But Dyke's eyes blazed with hatred. No, I will not spare him. Without hesitation, he drew a short knife and plunged it twice into Chukwudi's stomach. The young prince coughed up blood, his life ebbing away. The moment Chukwudi died, a deafening thunderclap shook the village. Dyke, unfazed, strode confidently to his throne. This is my kingdom, he declared. Not even the gods can stop me from ruling. Minutes later, a strange wind swirled around Chukwudi's body. To everyone's shock, the prince's corpse vanished along with the wind. Dyke's eyes widened in surprise. It seems my dead brother hasn't given up, he mused. But it doesn't matter. I'm indestructible. No matter what he does, he can't find the justice he seeks. The throne is mine, and I'm more powerful than any ghost. No one can defeat me now. Obiora approached the king cautiously. What do you think this means, your majesty? Could there be more trouble ahead? Dyke laughed, a cold, hollow sound. Let them try, my friend. We've proven our strength today. Let any ghost or god challenge us. We'll send them back to the afterlife. As night fell over the village, an uneasy quiet settled in. The few remaining villagers whispered among themselves, wondering what horrors the future might bring under King Dyke's reign. In the darkness, unseen by mortal eyes, the spirits of Abuka and Chukwudi watched. Their battle was lost, but perhaps the war for Omoha's soul was not yet over. Only time would tell if justice would ever come to their troubled kingdom. Three days passed without any sign of Prince Ibuka's ghost. The village of Umoha slowly returned to a state of uneasy calm. Some of the villagers who had fled during the supernatural battle began trickling back. After a few weeks of peace, the villagers started to believe that their troubles were truly over. Life seemed to be returning to normal, with people going about their daily routines. However, unbeknownst to everyone, a young man named Nedu was hiding in the shadows. He was Prince Chukwudi's friend, who had accompanied him to the village. Nedu had witnessed everything, and was consumed by grief and anger over his friend's death. One evening, as Nedu sat in his hiding place, he muttered to himself, I can't let that evil king get away with this. Chukwudi deserved better. Suddenly, he remembered something important. The seeds. I still have two of those strange seeds Chukwudi was given. Nedu recalled how he had secretly taken the seeds from the palace after the guards had confiscated them from Chukwudi. With these, I might be able to bring down the king. But how? Just then, he overheard two villagers talking nearby. Did you hear? One said. The king is holding a victory celebration tomorrow night. Really? The other replied. After everything that's happened. Nedu's eyes lit up. That's it, he whispered. The party is my chance. The next day, as preparations for the celebration were underway, Nedu carefully made his way to the palace kitchens. He watched the servants preparing food and drinks for the king. I just need to get close enough to the king's drink, Nedu thought. But how can I do it without being caught? He noticed a young servant boy struggling with a heavy tray of drinks. Nedu approached him, saying, Need some help with that? The boy nodded gratefully, and Nedu saw his opportunity. As he helped carry the tray, he discreetly dropped one of the seeds into a golden goblet he knew was meant for the king. Now we'll see if justice can finally be served, Nedu thought, his heart racing with anticipation and fear. During the celebration, King Dyke took a sip from his golden goblet. Suddenly, he felt a strange sensation, as if his powers were slowly draining away. At that moment, the ghost of Prince Eberka appeared, his face contorted with anger. Villagers screamed and fled in terror. To everyone's shock, the ghost was holding the seemingly lifeless body of Prince Chukwudi. King Dyke, unaware that his powers had vanished, prepared for battle. You dare return, he shouted. I'll destroy you once and for all. He attempted to unleash his powers, but nothing happened. Confused and desperate, Dyke turned to Obiora. Quick, my friend, let's combine our strength. They joined hands and tried to summon lightning, but Abuka's ghost easily deflected it. The ghost's eyes blazed with fiery anger. He attacked Dyke with a powerful force, sending the once mighty king crashing to the ground. Obiora attempted to fight back, but his powers were useless against the enraged spirit. Realizing his defeat was imminent, King Dyke's bravado crumbled. Wait, he cried out. I... 
I have something to confess. Turning to the terrified villagers, Dyke began to reveal his evil deeds. I killed our parents, I framed Ibuka and had him buried alive. Everything I've done was to seize power for myself. The villagers, shocked and angered by this revelation, began throwing stones at the fallen king. Ebuka's ghost approached Dyke, still holding Chukwudi's body. You brought evil upon your family, and now you shall receive evil in return. He placed his ghostly hands on both Chukwudi and Dyke. Dyke screamed in agony, his life force draining away. As Dyke's screams faded, Chukwudi's body began to stir. Prince Chukwudi opened his eyes, gasping for air. He looked up at his brother's ghost in amazement. Ibuka? How? How is this possible? How am I alive? Ibuka's ghost smiled gently. You deserve to live and rule, brother. Dyke's life has been exchanged for yours. Please, Chukwudi pleaded, don't leave me again. Stay with us. Ibuka shook his head. That's impossible, dear brother. I'm a ghost, and you're human. Our parents and I can now rest in peace, knowing justice has been served. My time here is done, Abuka continued. Rule peacefully, Chukwudi. You have our blessings. With those words, Abuka's ghost vanished. As the villagers gathered around their new king, they decided that Dyke's body, along with the unconscious Obiora, should not be buried in the village. Instead, they were cast into the evil forest, forever banished from Umoha. Prince Chukwudi, now King Chukwudi, looked out at his people. Let us begin anew, he said, with justice and kindness as our guiding principles. King Chukwudi's coronation was a joyous occasion for the village of Umoha. The people celebrated their new leader, hopeful for a peaceful future. Soon after, the king married a beautiful woman named Oluchi known for her kindness and wisdom. Nedu, the king's loyal friend who had helped bring justice to Umoha, was appointed as the king's personal assistant. The three of them worked together to rebuild the village and heal the wounds of the past. One sunny morning, King Chukwudi was in a meeting with the village elders, discussing plans for a new irrigation system. Suddenly, a palace maid burst into the room, her face flushed with excitement. My king, she exclaimed, bowing hastily, I bring wonderful news. Your wife, Queen Aluchi, has just given birth to a healthy baby boy. King Chukwudi's eyes widened in surprise and joy. He leapt to his feet, a broad smile spreading across his face. A son. I have a son. The elders around him broke into cheers and applause. Elder Nwosu, the oldest among them, raised his hands for silence. This calls for a celebration, your majesty. The gods have truly blessed our land with an heir. King Chukwudi, still grinning from ear to ear, turned to Nedu. My friend, go and spread the word throughout the village. Tell everyone to gather at the palace grounds. We must celebrate this joyous occasion. Nedu bowed, smiling. At once, your majesty, the people will be overjoyed. As Nedu hurried off, King Chukwudi addressed the elders. My friends, let us end our meeting early today. There will be time for discussions later. Now is the time for celebration. The elders nodded in agreement, their faces beaming with happiness. As they filed out of the room, King Chukwudi could hear them already beginning to plan the festivities. Left alone for a moment, the king's thoughts turned to his brother Ibuka and his parents. I wish you could be here to see this, he whispered. But I promise to raise this child with all the love and wisdom you've given me. With a deep breath, King Chukwudi straightened his robes and headed towards the royal chambers to meet his newborn son and embrace his wife. As he walked, he could hear the growing sounds of excitement from the village as news of the prince's birth spread. The future of Umoha looked bright indeed, with a just king, a loving queen, and now a young prince to carry on their legacy of peace and prosperity.